I'm very pleased to see you all here today, and I, I was really worried about the weather and what was going to happen, and we had people coming from quite a distance, so I'm very happy to see uh, such brave people. I'm going to give you all a gold star for having made it here today. It's quite wonderful. And um, I, I'm going to say, I have to say a couple of things. One, uh, that all the programs of the Poetry Center and all the other programs that we run, the Theater and Poetry Project, the Passaic County Cultural and Heritage Council, uh, the art galleries, and all the cultural programs that we run are all made possible by grants from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and um, private donations from individual people. Uh, we also have some other smaller uh, grants that we get, and by the support of Passaic County Community College. And as I say every time, I really want to thank Dr. Steve Rose, who is the president of Passaic County Community College, because he's been so supportive of this program, of all these programs, and um, is so pleased when he goes somewhere and people say, oh, you're the place with the Poetry Center. And he says, well, yes, we're the place with the Poetry Center. Of course, people across the street might not know that we're here, but people around the country do. Uh, anyway, uh, so we couldn't do any of this without funding and without people becoming members of the Poetry Center, giving us donations and that kind of thing. Grant money, of course, is, is always drying up, but uh, we've managed to keep going. And one thing that happens when you grow up without any money is you know how to stretch a penny until it screams bloody murder. So uh, <laughs> that's the one advantage of having grown up without any money, and a lot of other advantages, too. You never give up. Anyway, um, we, I started this contest probably in 1977, but we didn't call it the Allen Ginsberg contest until 1988. And, um, and that's after Allen came here a number of times and was very supportive of the Poetry Center. And I decided that he should have some recognition for his connection to the city and the fact that he grew up here. We went to the same high school, Eastside High School. And so I wanted to do something to honor him and his contribution to American literature, which I think is a very great contribution to American literature. Uh, so I had to ask whether I could name the contest after him, and he was very he was very pleased to have that happen, considering that about 10 years before, uh, the mayor had him escort, uh, escorted out of town and threatened to arrest him. <laughs> because he said at a reading that he had smoked grass at the falls. And so <laughs> at first he didn't want to come back here to read, but then I talked him into it. And then he came back quite a few times and participated in the programs. And it was wonderful. He was, he was a wonderful person. Anyway, today I'm pleased to welcome all the winners of the Allen Ginsberg Awards, and I will say that we get about 2,000 entries uh, to this award, and we have four ju judges, and all the judges have to agree. So we made a rule to start with all the judges have to agree on the winners of the poem. So um, if you won or your honorable mention, and the distance between the winners and the honorable mention is never that huge because people are fighting who should get first prize, who should get second prize, and that sort of thing. But um, it, it, I, I always am happy when I hear the poems that are selected and realize how, how much wonderful poetry there is in the world and how great it is to encourage that poetry. So today we're going to start with uh, one of our first prize winners, and that's Linda Cronin. And Linda is a poet, editor, and freelance writer. A Dream Bones, Bones from Word, Word Tech Editions is her first published collection of poems. She tied for first place in the 2014 Allen Ginsberg Poetry Contest. Her work has appeared in literary magazines such as the Patterson Literary Review, Word Gathering, New Jersey of New Jersey Poets, Rattle and Lips. Let's welcome Linda Cronin. Susan, and everyone who keeps the poetry set and running. 
it's really made a difference to me and the rest of the poets are here. Um, I'm very honored to have won today, and I congratulate my fellow winners, the all the poets here, and it's honored to share this prize with Linda Hilling House. My poem is called Because It's Mine. There are days when I look in the mirror and I hate what I see. This clunker, this misshapen body that fails me time and again. My face with its chip on cheeks and moon shape looms over a neck that refuses to hold my head up high. My arms and legs that lack the muscle strain to get out of bed, to dress myself and brush my hair, to climb the stairs. The joints twisted and knotted, the hollow bones crumbling beneath the pressure of gravity beneath my gaze. I remember my fear when I woke from my last spine surgery, unable to move, the respirator swallowing my pleas. You held my hand and coaxed me through the terror. I fear there will come a day when my body won't be strong enough to keep fighting, when I won't wake up. But you tell me you see something I don't. Love this body I hate. Love my skin soft as feathers, my eyes the warm brown of chestnuts. You tell me you see a woman with courage, a body that fights its way through each day. You tell me you love this body because it's mine. There are days when I need to believe I am beautiful as my hands weaken and drop four pulls of spaghetti on my lap, as my lungs, legs stumble, transferring me to a chair. On those days, I need to learn to love my body just because it tries, just because you do. second anniversary of your death. When I look at the photograph you took wandering the back roads of Vermont in autumn, the trees towering above you, torches of ruby, copper, and gold guarding your safe passage, I imagine you are there still, passing your days, meandering with a camera in one hand, and beside you, on the sea, your trusty companions of notebook and pen. I need to believe you're somewhere just beyond my reach, Beneath the same moon and stars, still busy filling your days with nothing so filled with something that you have neither the inclination nor the time to do anything else. The next poem is called The Search for Beauty. For a time, I found beauty one stitched piece at a time, counted cross stitch, hardinger, embroidery, and needlework. I tried them all, and each one had its place. I discovered the beauty in the blood red tulips and the pale yellow roses, or in a string of lazy daisies all in a row, all created with a needle and thread pulled by my fingers. I stitched the open valleys filled with evergreens and wildflowers, the houses of Charleston and Savannah, and the painted ladies of Cape May. And with each piece I finished, I felt a sense of accomplishment that my hands, these hands that struggle some days, created such beauty. These days I can no longer stitch, but most times I have simpler goals, and every day I wake hopeful today will be better, that my finger will grasp my pen so I can put that pen to paper and let the words flow, hoping to reach that place where truth and beauty lies waiting. similar to this one about a character we remember from our childhood. And this one's about a man named Charlie, who uh, all the kids I went to school still remember. Who can forget Charlie? Remember the candy man from Harrison's drugstore with his gentle drifts of snowy white hair that tried to cover the shiny scalp, the gray button-down sweater that hugged his generous belly, who kids imagined was filled with milk chocolate and lollipops, the one who ruled our lunch hours, the president of our walk home from school, who determined how successful the day would be. His ruling was absolute, but Charlie was generous to a fault. And on those days, we were lucky enough to get lunch money, to spend the friendliest of proper ponies. We ran to the restaurants where we wasted our time debating the merits of a grilled cheese or a hot dog. The waitresses were slower to arrive than the first day of summer vacation, and we often bolted down the meal just out of time to visit the candy counter. 
As the lunch hour drew to close, the stuffy air of the pharmacy would ring with our high-pitched and shouting voices. How much for M&M's and juicy fruit, Charlie? Can I get a Snickers and Raisinets? Soon the older kids learned Charlie's answer always was, let me see what you got. And sure enough, more often than not, you were able to buy what you wanted if you weren't too greedy. I guess the math worked out in the end, for Charlie was a staple through the years. He was there before all his brothers, and still there after the young sibling. So he must have broke even at some point <coughs> down the line. Those that overpaid made up for those with less. It was market pricing in its earliest of days. Charlie always knew profit was based on what the market could demand. In my first book, I had a poem called uh, Jersey Girl. And I recently um, began thinking about what a real Jersey girl was. And that's this, this is my last poem, The Real Jersey Girl. I am Jersey born and bred through and through. I made these highways and back roads my own by driving the miles, walking the land, picnicking under its watchful skies. From the beaches of Cape May to the cliffs of the Hudson and the towering hills and fields surrounding High Point. But if you ask someone from Idaho or Montana, where winter lasts forever, or Arizona or New Mexico, where the ungodly heat is closely opaque to dry, those places we in Jersey don't believe anyone can willingly choose to live, I am not what they imagine. They immediately think of Snooky from Jersey Shore, or the so-called beauties of the Jersey housewives. They think of a female version of Beverly Christie, a woman who ages before she does, oh, someone with wild hair, hairspray to give out its own dramatic makeup, vivid eyeshadow, and elaborately manicured nails that leave a mark. A voluptuous figure that spills over a glittery top and a skin-tight pair of designer jeans or leather pants. They imagine the typical Jersey girl searches not for a career, but for a diamond and a sugar daddy, spends her days on the telephone or the hippest restaurants, dishing the latest gossip and spreading rumors. Instead, we Jersey girls spend our days with a pen in our hand and words and images swirling through our head, stealing time not for gossip, but for poetry. We believe in playing with our children, visiting with friends and relatives, and worrying over our parents, talking with our husbands. We eat dinner at home surrounded by family, not our besties, and hope for a good life. Like so many others, we are the real Jersey girls, the ones who make New Jersey what it is great. Thank you. <laughs> winner is Linda Hillinghouse. Linda is a poet and a painter. She received the Pablo Neruda, Neruda Prize for Poetry 2012, second place, and the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award 2014, shared first place. A self-taught artist, she has shown her work at the Newark Museum, the Patterson Museum, and the Yale School of Art, among other venues. If you don't know Linda Hillinghouse's paintings, you must know Linda Hillinghouse's paintings. And in fact, her paintings are on the cover of two of my books out there. But she is an amazing artist, as well as an amazing poet. Let's welcome Linda Hillinghouse. Plaza Hotel, Wildwood. 
From the fifth floor balcony of the Bristol Plaza Hotel, I watch families on the boardwalk, parents in flip-flops and tank tops, kids on invisible leashes running up and down the steps to the sand in that delirium of summer when memory and history have just begun. And what would it have been like to have had children, to unpack bathing caps and board games, cough syrup and calamine, to wrap bologna sandwiches in waxed paper, and buy peaches from the produce truck parked on the street between the hotel and the dunes. And look at us, how happy we were, positioning the blanket as carefully as a communion cloth placing a sandal at each corner, the Atlantic behind us ready to roll, and the kids running into the waves with joyful terror, and I, exalted by love, carry them aloft out of the sea. And all around, from Pompton Lakes, Far Rockaway, and Parsippany, people come with can openers and band-aids and stories of splinters and shark scares. And we smile and nod at the way life is unfolding at the Jersey Shore, while the kids stick shells and bottle caps atop their castles and run caravans to and from the sea to fetch water for the moats and ponds. And when the sun gets low in the sky, we pick up the sandwich wrappers sweatshirts and checkers, shake out the blanket, pack the towels and tubes, and the kids say heartbroken farewells to their new friends who are leaving from a touching in the morning. Then we trek to the shower at the bottom of the bleached cedar steps and wash the sand from our feet as the sea behind us stops swirling. And when it's nearly dark and the moon up over the Ferris wheel is almost too big for the eye to bear. We go to the boardwalk and take our place among the generations. And I hold the hands of my children and lead them to the ring toss and ski ball and to the mechanical claw that descends in somnolence from the ceiling of the glass tank to hover above the hill of trinkets and the arthritic metal fingers open and grab onto a rubber spider, a skull ring, or a capsule containing a pink plastic seahorse. And the claw lifts the prize as if it were Venetian glass and drops it down the chute into the frantic hands of my children who plead for more tokens while the life-size gypsy turbaned and bejeweled watches in malice from her lacquered ticket booth. And I lift my kids up onto the carousel horses where they sit enraptured by the leather reins and the lunatic eye of the horse looking backwards. And I live to glimpse their faces and fluorescent hair as they ride by rising and falling to the old world band organ. And I will not be dreaming this or thinking the way I always think in dark conjecture. dismantle the sad town we had built. But in the last stage of demolition, I suckered you into a trip to Spain, thinking I could work some magic on foreign soil, telling my boss the punishing lie I needed time off for my honeymoon. But there was no tender reconciliation in Barcelona, just a vaginal infection to underscore the rot. Really, what was I thinking? that the cattle and moon would wash our sheets and gold and cauterize my soul 
that I would emerge from our room like the Virgin of Montserrat, and the story of my sorry ass and its piteous origins would play out on the stage of your compassion, and you would forgive my faithlessness in all its lurid incarnations. What was I thinking, standing at the door to hell, a demon's tongue around my neck, that you would tackle me to safety as Blakeian shafts of light burst through the clouds like vast trade routes to and from heaven, and the great saints would stagger out of churches, and the sun would go black, and we'd land on your lawn in Patterson in summer at dusk, a second chance to see the hydrangea in green shadows, and I would love you with depth and clarity as we strolled through La Plaza del Sol on our way to the future. But the truth is, I stole seven years from you, a lifetime when you're young, and all the years I paid gave you nothing back. The nosebleed. Little uncle, remember me in my bed? My nose packed with gauze strips, wet washcloth over my face like a savage veil. Can you see me from far away, from nowhere, lying there, silent as snow? steadfast soldier in the family army, immobilized in my pilled yellow pajamas with the dancing ponies, your practiced hand, the drafty room, the smell of ruin. This thing stands alone outside of time, and since it is mine to keep with its blindness and bolus of blood, I want to say something without irony or forgiveness, but with bitterness, like a bitter root lodged in the tongue, because that is what became of that day, what took hold that day in my narrow bed when you ushered in the age of secrets, when you woke up this hapless flesh from its sheltering sleep. Like I'd always seen her bucking and shaking and holding on to the safety rail while an aide wipes her ass. It's no big thing now, the way her toenails look like ancient teeth and her hands like two sick jellyfish floating around her torso. Like her arms and legs had never looked like anything but purple tentacles, <coughs> as if she were beginning to turn inside out the skeleton pushing aside muscle and artery. It's business as usual now, wheeling her to the dining room as she tries to propel herself from the chair with her last ounce of strength. She is not going gentle into that shitty night, and I'm proud of how she fires off no, her last defense against disappearing. But when I walk in as the aide is undressing her, her right breast is a testament to all that was given and to all that was lost. And the scar tissue on the left, a searing indictment of a careless God. Okay, and the last one. Without consent. The light scatters into the ultraviolet, into the clouds that gather over the river, like the thoughts of the river, into the minds of birds that rise from the reeds, like us, surfacing without consent in dreams. 
To know nothing must be a tribute to something or a dereliction or holiness itself. 